Hello, welcome to the BFQ Linux IO scheduler optimization for multi-actuator SATA hard drives presentation. Uh, my name is Tim Walker. I'm a principal engineer at Seagate Technologies. And I'm Paolo Valente, an assistant professor at the University of Modena Reggio Emilia in Italy, but I'm also an external collaborator of Linaro and I've done this work exactly for, for Linaro. Today, our agenda is we're going to have a brief review of multi-actuator drives and some of the um, benefits and issues. We're going to talk about how we deployed BFQ IO scheduler changes to address and improve the performance, and going to show just a couple of benchmark results. Multi-actuator drives. Um, Multi-actuator drives are the, a new technology, fairly new technology for hard drives. Come up, we have the need for these because of the increase in capacity that the hard drive technology has been driving the last few years and, the, and what's coming up with the energy-assisted uh, recording techniques that um, the companies are starting to field. Capacity per platter and capacity per drive has really been increasing over the last few years. However, the fundamental servo mechanical performance of the drive has not. We're still seeking with the same kind of seek times that we've been seeking at for a number of years. And so the end result is we have a lot more data behind every actuator, but the actuators are not getting faster. So one of the primary metric on data accessibility is uh, IOPS per terabyte, which describes how many, I, how many raw servo mechanical IOPS you can drive per terabyte of capacity. With capacity going up, but servo mechanical performance not, it's easy to see the IOPS per terabyte is going down. Our customers have a threshold of IOPS per terabyte to meet their SLAs. Our customers have been driving the required IOPS per terabyte down over the years, driving them down with better data management, with tiering, uh, better queuing um, and other advanced ways of managing storage, but they're not, our customers are not driving the IOPS per terabyte requirements down fast enough. And we're seeing a gap today and off in the future um, that is limiting some of the uses that hard drives are good for. To mitigate the IOPS per terabyte gap, Today, customers are, you know, as you know, replacing hard drives with flash. We are short stroking hard drives in some applications where the customer only uses uh, the first half to two thirds of the drive capacity. That's at the OD, keeping seat lengths down and transfer rates up. So that is the highest performing part of the hard drive. And we have some customers who are, I mean, there's still a, a good market for, you know, four and six terabyte drives because. Uh, they just naturally have a higher IOPS per terabyte capability, but the disadvantage of that is, of course, the power and the slot count goes way up. None of these mitigations improve storage total cost ownership. So we need to find a, we need to find a way to help close this um, gap of IOPS per terabyte and using the Adding another actuator is a very straightforward way to do it. Adding a second actuator is a great thing for hard drive manufacturers to do because this is what we know how to do. Actuators, bearings, pivots, heads, preamps. When we deploy this kind of a scheme, we are deploying, we are you know, doubling in, in most cases the raw servo mechanical performance on the drive. And so that by, by going straight down to the, to the physics of the drive, that gives us a solid foundation for improving the hard drive performance all the way up the stack. In this particular case, the drive we're gonna talk about today with the challenges that they presented is a SATA version of a split actuator hard drive. It's a split actuator, so it has two, the actuator, you can envision this the actuator is sawed in half. Uh, the upper actuator has heads on the upper platters. The lower actuator has heads on the lower platter. 
no platter has heads from both actuators. So any given sector is only reachable on a particular actuator. We did this with SAS a couple of years ago. And with the SAS implementation, we assigned a logical unit to each actuator. So a SAS multi-actuator drive has two LUNs, zero and one, and LUN zero is on one actuator and LUN one is on the other. That made it really simple to know where your data was. It made it simple to manage the workload between the actuators, but SATA doesn't have LUNs. SATA only has one address space. So you have to have a scheme to divide the actuators, to assign an LBA in the, in the address space to one actuator or the other. There's a number of ways to do it. The current one that Seagate is shipping to early customers now is the split address space, where we divided the address space in half. Lower half of the address space goes to the lower actuator. The upper half of the address space goes to the other actuator. On this kind of design, most of the system is in, independent. The, we have independent read channels. We have independent servos, independent preamps. We know we have independent actuators. Um, we have a, most of the logic. Uh, the, the silicon on the controller is independent between the two actuators. It really doesn't share much at all. But we, because it's SATA and there's only a single namespace, a single endpoint, we have to share the command queue, the hardware command queue. And with SATA, it's only 32D. On, on a SAS implementation, you have a lot of, you have a lot of queue depth to play with. But with SAS, and it's only being 32 deep, it's easy to envision the case where the queue is monopolized by commands from one actuator and there's no room for commands to the other actuator. It's easy for the operating system or a file system or a customer that uses storage directly to generate enough I.O. to do, thir to do 32 commands. And if you get 32 commands for the lower actuator in the command queue, then the upper actuator has no commands in the command queue and that actuator goes idle. In order to get the performance benefit from this drive, it's essential we keep the actuators busy. If an actuator is idle, then the drive operates at single actuator speed. But with this shallow command queue, then we have to manage that resource and ensure that we do not allow it to fill with commands for one actuator and lock out the other. There's no way to do that in the SATA um, protocol. We can't tell the host only send us commands to the upper half of the address space. And we don't really have a good way to you know, reject commands. That, For example, if we had 31 commands for the lower and we received another one, we can't send that one back and say, please send this one for the upper. So it has to be managed externally. And that's what this project is about, is managing the workload coming down to the drive so that the actuators stay busy. What this project doesn't do is remap any IO. It does not take a IO stream and divvy it up amongst the actuators. The IO streams that come down are this, this IO that comes down, it's the same IO that was generated by the file system or the application. If the file system is looking to, to access an LBA that is mapped to the lower actuator, it's always going to go to lower actuator. What this project does do is prevent an aggressive workload on one actuator from denying service to the other. We use this um, graphic here to help us analyze the drive performance under these workloads. This, even though this, it looks like a solid blue box, it's a heat map full of rectangular regions. It's just most of these are at zero for this particular case, which is a, this is a, this shows worst case IO distribution. What this chart shows is we have the upper Q depth on the vertical axis with lower Q depth on the horizontal axis. And so at any time you can have up to 32 on one and you can have 32, uh, up to 32 on the other, but the sum of the two can never exceed 32. So in this 
in this um, heat map, you would expect to see operating points down and to the left of the, a diagonal across the, uh, the chart. Because the two together can never exceed, the, the sum of the two Q depths can never exceed 32. That's all that fits in the, in the hardware Q. The ideal, you know, if you want to have the optimal performance, then we need to maintain a minimum Q depth per actuator. And that minimum Q depth depends on the, on the workload. So if it's a sequential workload, for example, if you have a Q depth of two or three, you will hit you know, the disk performance and that's all you need. If it's a random workload, then a deeper Q depth improves performance a lot. Uh, but, but what we do know about these is that even for a random workload, if you can have a Q depth of four to five, you can normally get about 75% of the performance of the, of the absolute random performance of that actuator. And like I said, for sequentials, a Q depth of two or three gives you full performance. So our goal on this project is to make sure that if there is work available for an actuator, that that work be presented to the drive and that as long as there's work available, no actuator's Q depth falls below a threshold. And the threshold is adjustable. Currently it's at four. Um, there's some, there's some um, opportunity there to, you know, to, to tune that and make this, uh, or, or dynamic, but today what we're talking about is, is a static threshold. So again, that what this chart shows us in this particular workload here, this workload is a random read, a random 4K read workload with the Q, with 80 IOs in flight per actuator, generated by FIO. And uh, so we don't have 80 commands in the queue, obviously in the drive queue, we have 80 commands stacked up um, in the block layer all the time, um, waiting to come down to the drive. Again, 4K random reads. What this shows then is that most of the time, this system during the, during the time period that this data was taken, most of the time, this, the lower Q depth is running at zero or one. That's a yellow square in the upper left. Um, and the upper Q depth is running uh, at a 30 or 31, which is because that's that yellow, that's if you look at that yellow box, that's in the heat map, that's, you know, 31 and uh, zero and one, 30 and 30, 31 and 32 and zero and one. In addition, you can see there's some histograms. Um, this top histogram on the top, is a histogram for the lower Q depth for the horizontal axis. And that histogram shows a, a big mode at a low Q depth. And then the histogram on the right, which is vertical, um, shows a, a large single uh, node at upper, very, very deep Q depth and a little bit of low, you know, two to four Q depth down towards the bottom. This is where we started from. This is the problem that we we're trying to avoid. In this case, because with a random workload like this, you're going to see very poor overall performance. The, um, the upper actuator, because it's a deep Q and random workload is going to be doing great. But the lower actuator with the random workload and the Q depth of zero and one, performance is going to be poor. And the aggregate performance of the drive, um, it's not going to be what the customer paid for or expects. So. We have, to, we have to control the workload and make sure, we have to move this operating point away from that corner and, and keep the Q depth to the lower actuator, in this case, a little higher so that we can keep the lower actuator busy. And we need a place, we need a place that, can, that knows what the workload down to the storage device is and has a way to affect it. And of course, that is the IO scheduler. Okay, thank you. Thank you, team. Uh, and yeah, next slide. So uh, IO schedulers are uh, components that decide the order in, in which uh, the system will serve IO, uh, IO requests. 
um, yeah, the, the, the general term is, of course, uh, command, but uh, the scheduler focuses mainly on um, read and write commands. So, yeah, that, that, that's uh, the goal of a scheduler is basically um, making um, applications, processes share uh, the bandwidth available for, for reading and for writing on, on a given device. So, you can imagine uh, the scheduler as sort of uh, traffic policeman. Uh, <laughs> standing in an intersection and deciding uh, who can cross uh, the intersection. But in this case, uh, the uh, shared resource is, is not a, an actual intersection, but uh, it's, it's a drive, it's a disk. In general, a scheduler can work on a CPU and or a generic other shared uh, resources. So this, this is the role of a scheduler, and it designs this order with several goals. Uh, one of the main goals is guaranteeing a high throughput because there are better ways to order uh, the access to, to, to a drive uh, um, for getting a higher, a higher throughput. So one of the roles of a scheduler is uh, discovering, finding the, the, the best order to, to get the highest possible uh, throughput. Uh, another goal, which is sort of uh, opposite, some, it's, it, which is often conflicting with getting a high throughput as a goal, is uh, guaranteeing a low latency. So often uh, uh, to get the low latency, one must sacrifice a throughput. But the scheduler tries somehow to get both goals or at least to get a good trade-off between these two um, goals. So one of the goals is having a low uh, latency. With this example with uh, roads and cars, um, uh, the traffic policeman tries to avoid that some car stays there forever or for a very long time before crossing the, the intersection. A uh, more um, abstract uh, and complex goal related to guaranteeing a low latency to single commands is guaranteeing a high responsiveness to a system. Also, the other way to, to say this is to guarantee a low lag. Another goal is fairness, so guaranteeing a fair access to a certain device when there are several competitors for that device, and, and so on and, and, and so forth. What is important for our problem here is that uh, if we want to use a scheduler to also control the balance uh, between uh, actuators, then we need a scheduler that uh, provides us a good ground for implementing uh, some accurate, sophisticated, good, flexible uh, logic on top of it. Uh, in this respect, in Linux, uh, uh, we have four IO schedulers available, a uh, known MQ, Delta, and Kyber, and BFQ. Uh, and among these, BFQ is actually the one uh, with the richest, uh, uh, how can I say, structure. So, and, and this, this uh, control plane infrastructure is probably the best ground for putting some, for growing something complex on top of it. Uh, yeah, please, um, Tim, the next slide. I, w I was clicking for <laughs> key on. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and uh, let's see this complex infrastructure. Uh, um, there it is. So we have processes doing read and write operations. These are translated by the IO layers into actual IO requests. And these requests flow through uh, uh, the IO scheduler. Um, and in the case of BFQ, um, these requests are classified into separate flows. Each of these flows um, is sent into a dedicated queue. Uh, and each of these queues is in turn scheduled uh, with a um, given logic. And the usual logic with which the requests inside each queue are scheduled is just the elevator logic. So basically, inside each queue, requests are ordered so that uh, um, uh, the elevator order is guaranteed and throughput is maximized through this uh, basic uh, service uh, order. I think this is more or less. So um, then there is this service loop here, uh, which decides which queue to serve. But I'm about to show you in a moment this, this service logic. 
the, the final point here is the, the, the point where uh, a dispatch is executed. Basically, the rest of the system asks for the next request to serve to the scheduler upon a dispatch, and the scheduler uh, tells to the system what, which is the request to serve. This request is then removed from uh, the queue where it is temporarily stored and uh, passed to, to, the, to, the, to the device. So this is more or less all. So please, Tim, next slide. Um, I don't, I don't know whether you have already switched to the next slide, but I don't see it yet. Yeah. Okay, there it is. So um, um, I told you that I showed you that there is a service loop. So uh, basically, uh, the scheme is this one. There is a separate I/O flow for each process doing I/O. This is the typical classification. Uh, this flow is enqueued in a separate request queue, as I already showed you. There is a weight associated with each process and so with each queue. And in that uh, uh, process, this service loop that, uh, that was shown in the previous scheme, uh, what happens is what is shown in this diagram here. Each queue is served for a while. So for example, Q3 is served for a while, then I don't know, Q7, then Q3 again, then Q2 and so on. So um, this service order uh, evidently is not random, but uh, it's, a, it's computed by the scaler, which is the core job of the scaler. The core job of the scaler is computing the service order. And uh, this is a service order such that each of these queues is served on average at a rate proportional to the weight of the queue. So basically each queue gets a share of the bandwidth proportional to the weight of the queue. Next slide, please, Tim. Oh, okay. Uh, so um, that's the scheme. With a multi-actuator drive, this soon becomes a problem. Because for example, a process may generate requests for any actuator. And the scheduling logic that I showed before does not take actuator into account in, in any respect. So there's no guarantee uh, about the balance, the load balance among these actuators. That policy, um, that logic doesn't provide any guarantee on balancing the load on the actuators. Even worse, the same process may generate requests for both actuators. And the internal logic inside each queue, the one that I told you before, this, that simple elevator logic, again, provides no guarantee that requests um, for a given actuator are saved, are not, that do, do not start inside that queue. So here's an example to, to show what I said. Uh, we have again the same service shown in the previous slide, and this service may cause an unbalance. For example, if we have Q3 with only request for the lower actuator. Uh, okay, and QT is served, so we have only request for the lower actuator served. Then Q7 again, it contains only requests for the lower actuator. So again, only the lower actuator in service and Q3 the same. Maybe Q2 could contain requests for both actuators, but again, since there's no guarantee inside each queue, maybe only, again, only requests for the uh, lower actuator are set. So in this service scheme here, the upper actuator never gets any request. So it's just starting, it's idle. So that's the problem. And uh, so what's the basic idea? Simply let's split each queue into one queue for each actuator. So in general, we will have each process associated with n separate queue one for each actuator. And if we do so, the service loop this time will guarantee that all queues, and therefore in this case, all actuators are set. Because as I told you before, the service loop basically gives to each queue a fraction of the bandwidth proportional to the weight of the queue. So in the end, all queues will be set in proportion to their weights. If we have a queue for each actuator, we are guaranteed that all actuators will be served just because all queues will be served. So this is shown in this figure here where we have one queue for each actuator. Some of these queues actually contain, contain requests for both uh, actuator and the service loop will guarantee that both, kind of, uh, both kinds of requests will get eventually to the drive. Okay. And uh, 
where after implementing this extension, this is how the uh, um, heat map changes. Now we have both actuators in use because the uh, now we don't have only one state with probability basically almost one. Now we have two states uh, and these states share the probability. Okay, so we can have, we, we do have both, both states possible, uh, but the problem now, I mean, the situation is much better. We still have a problem. As Tim highlighted before, we would like to have uh, probabilities, uh, higher probabilities somehow on the diagonal here, but now we are on the extremes, which means that either we have one actuator basis or we have the other actuator basis. So, one of the two actuators is idle and vice versa. Why does this happen? Uh, it happens because we here we have two read streams. Um, before then, um, Tim told you that these were random, but maybe Tim, I think these are sequential, but very small. So maybe that, that's exactly so. The requests are small as in a random workload, but I guess that they are sequential in, in, in this case. Anyway, uh, we have these two streams and with this workload, the best uh, service scheme is serving one queue at a time for a long time. This maximizes throughput, but this happens with one actuator, with a single actuator. If we have a, a dual actuator, the service scheme becomes counterproductive for the reason shown through this other figure here. While we are serving one of the two queues, we have only uh, one of the two actuators busy because we are sending requests only to one of the two actuators. So in this case, the upper actuator is idle. Then the FQ switches to the other queue. So it starts serving, sending, dispatching only requests for the other actuator. So very quickly, the upper actuator becomes idle because it's not receiving any requests any longer. And only the other actuator is receiving requests, so it becomes busy, while the other one, <laughs> unfortunately, is idle. Then again, there is a switch to Q1 and the situation simply reverses. Um, this service happens, occurs, lasts for long, as I told you before. So uh, while we are sending the upper actuator, the lower one is idle for a lot of time. When we switch to the other one, the upper, uh, the lower becomes idle and remains idle for a lot of time. And then we switch to the opposite situation and so on. That's the reason why we have one of the two actuator idle for a lot of time. Thank you, Tim. Okay, let's see when the new one shows up. Oh. Don't see it yet. It's slow, isn't it? Yeah, it's very slow. Okay, and this problem is, is even more general because there may be cases where some actuator is even more underutilized. One case is when, if, if is if we have many queues that contain a yo for a given actuator, while few queues contain a yo for the other actuator, as shown in this figure here. We have many more queues uh, for the lower actuator and uh, only two queues for the upper actuator, and fewer queues for the upper, much fewer queues for the upper actuator. In this case, the, just the policy of VFQ uh, will let make only one of the two actuators get a lot of requests, while the other one will wait because will be much more idle just because few queues contain IO for the other actuator. Um, a similar case is if we have maybe only one queue uh, containing IO for a given actuator, but that queue has a much higher weight and the other queue. So also in this case, that queue will receive a lot of service compared with the other queues, which means that that actuator will receive a lot of IO, while the other actuators will receive very little IO. Okay, thank you. And uh, so we had this idea. Let's just inject IO for the other actuator. So what, what's the idea? While we are sending a queue that contains a yo for a given actuator, we inject 
which basically means that we just dispatch some IO for the other actuators. In, in, in which case, in case the other actuators are underutilized. So even if we are saving a given Q, because this that's the BFQ's policy, we, uh, in, in any case, uh, also inject a little bit of IO requests also for the other uh, actuators. Uh, what's our criterion? Our criterion is to keep uh, um, busy enough also the other actuators. And we do that by setting a threshold. We have a threshold to decide whether or not to inject. Basically, if, when, when we, are, we have a queue containing requests for a given actuator, if the other actuator is below a certain low threshold, then we also inject a little bit of IO for the other actuator. Basically, uh, we um, preempt the queue in service until the other actuator reaches the threshold. So we don't send IO for a given actuator, even if that queue is in service for that actuator, until the other actuator has at least that minimum number of uh, requests of command uh, queued. The current threshold is four. We started with four as a threshold. Uh, this is the result. Now the two uh, yellow rectangles have moved and uh, we can see that when we have, um, for example, uh, the upper actuator uh, in service, so with many IO commands queued, then also in that case, we have the lower, the lower actuator with at least around four uh, commands uh, queued and vice versa in the other case. So now oh, we are guaranteeing that none of the actuator is ever idle. And this is the result in terms of true boot. Uh, we have with the red bar, the true boot with BFQ uh, after adding also this injection uh, feature. And so we have a throughput that is around 25% higher than the highest throughput reached by any of the other IO scheduler. In this, uh, um, this plot, we have also shown the performance of BFQ without injection as a comparison to show the gain of this injection injection uh, feature. It is important to also say that uh, not only the throughput is higher than that of the other scheduler, but it's also more stable because now we have control on the IO that we send to the drive. So with this specific workload, we get this um, extra throughput, but also uh, with other workloads, we are guaranteed that we are somehow close to optimal performance, while with the other IO scheduler, basically we have no control on load balance, so it's basically a matter of luck, the truth that we get uh, with the other schedulers. So to wrap up, uh, this is still, uh, however, still a preliminary contribution. Uh, I've shown you results only for one workload, I don't know whether uh, Tim will add uh, anything more. Uh, and no production code is available yet, but we are uh, working on that too. There are still some open issues. For example, injection does not take bandwidth distribution into account. So it does not respect weights. It simply tries to keep each actuator uh, busy enough, let's say so. This could be a problem maybe in terms of bandwidth distribution. Another open issue, important open issue is what is the best value for this threshold? This value most certainly depends on the workload. So maybe a dynamic threshold is maybe the best solution, but maybe also a static threshold could be enough to provide acceptable for more performance. And by sticking to a, a static threshold, we would definitely reduce complexity compared with something dynamic, which would then have corner cases and, and so on. Okay, I think this is all uh, for me. So thank you, Tim. I don't know whether you will add anything else. Yeah, thanks for listening to our presentation. Um, Paulo's observation is correct. We only presented the um, sequential, and he's right, this was a sequential workload, my bad. 
um, results. We have lots of, we've shown lots of good results with a lot of other workloads. Um, the, our, our objective today was not to uh, exhaust you with the numerous workload combinations. And uh, we've also proven to ourselves that in the case where we have a number of, of processes where we have a large number of processes driving one act that drive one actuator and a small number of processes who are using the other actuator we're you know we're stable under those conditions as well because of the injection um, our next steps on this are to to finish up the plumbing internally on the kernel um, damien lamal and uh and wd has uh, release some patches to um, pull the log page, the SATA and SAS log page that describe um, the sector to uh, actuator mapping and make them available uh, both in the sys file system and internally to the kernel. And so we will be uh, attaching BFQ to that so that BFQ um, will know exactly what the geometry is. Um, and then we have uh, you know, some more tuning and uh, results that we're working on to uh, harden the code and get ready to present it to be upstream. Again, that's the end. Uh, a lot of great work. Appreciate uh, Monaro and uh, Paulo and uh, all the work that they did on this with us. It's been really interesting to uh, to instrument the kernel and see what our results are and what the IO distribution looks like and to see some results. Of course, it's always rewarding. Um, thanks again. That's all I have. Paul, anything? No, no, that's all. Thank you. Thank you.